Hi there. It's a brand new month. It's a brand new week. And I'm back again with a brand new webinar. Welcome to yet another webinar on platform engineering. And today we would be discussing about Backstage and how to build efficient developer portals using Backstage, which is a synonymous name when it comes to platform engineering. Well, most of you would know me. Uh, for everyone new who is joining in, I am Atul, your host for the webinar. I am a senior developer advocate at InfraCloud Technologies, where I help individuals and teams adopt open source tools and technologies by means of creating content, building demos and POCs, and doing webinars like these. I'm also a CNCF ambassador and quite involved in organizing meetups. And I'm organizing my cities, Hyderabad's first Kubernetes Community Days event in a couple of weeks' time. And when I'm not working or doing community work, I'm a big time foodie and a travel blogger. So, you know, you can find me at a restaurant trying out some new cuisine. Well, while that's enough of me, you know, you can, I, I can just go on and on talking about things. There are two things that I would like to ask you before I move forward. For all my developer friends who have joined this webinar, do you often find yourself shuttling between different tools? even to find the most basic information like a documentation related or a code snippet or something related to your service or library. If you do, or if you don't, just drop in your answers in the comments. Uh, to all my engineering managers, I'm sure you would be struggling to hire your new board. I mean, hi, hi, to have your new hires on board in a shorter time. Usually it takes a long time. And I'm sure if you are facing any of these issues, do let me know in the comments because that is what is going to be our focus area for today. Uh, do, also, do let me know where are you joining in from so that we all know that we have a great panel here along with a wonderful audience. And like always, I am not here alone. I have two wonderful guests uh, with me today. So I'll bring them on to the stage and let them introduce to uh, introduce themselves to you. So I have Sri. And I have Frank joining in onto the stage. Hi, Sri. Hi, Frank. Thank you so much for joining in. Usually, I don't do introductions because I feel it's best for my guests to introduce themselves. So uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself uh, to our audience. Tell us who you are, what you do, uh, what do you like doing outside of work. So Sri, maybe you could go ahead first. Sounds good. Uh, happy to be here, uh, Atul. Um, I'm Shri, a senior product manager on um, Spotify's platform developer experience team. Uh, my team and I are responsible for a commercial plugin called Soundcheck. Um, and um, I, outside of work, I enjoy singing, um, meditating, and killing a few plants in my gardens. Um, I'm not a green thumb, a green thumb, but I love to try out uh, planting new. Um, uh, plans and I've started with tomatoes this season. Let's see how that goes. Over to you, Frank. Hey, uh, I'm Frank. Um, I'm a uh, senior software engineer at Spotify, um, uh, working with Stray on the soundtrack team. Uh, I guess outside of work, the picture that I have is kind of misleading. It shows that maybe I like hiking and stuff. I actually hate hiking. I'm very allergic to the out to like stuff in the outdoors. So that's something I, I really dislike. Um, yeah, I mean, my uh, I'm a pretty big gamer, like uh, not as a hobby as like this is like like I, I have every single console and I collect a lot of old video games. Uh, so that's like one of my my major hobbies. Um, cool. Yeah, I'll turn it back to you. Interesting. So we have a singer and we have a gamer tonight. And you have me and all three of us are going to discuss platform engineering out of nowhere. So I'm sure it's going to be a, a, a great uh, discussion. And uh, moving ahead, uh, if you have been watching our, our previous webinars, you know that every time I speak, I come up with a different analogy for platform engineering. So if you attended the previous webinar, you would have learned that I spoke about how platform engineering is similar to a kitchen we spoke about chefs ingredients recipes so on and so forth today i have a different webinar and uh, sorry today i have a different analogy and as sri mentioned that she is a singer i would like to give you all a 
analogy of a concert, a music concert. I'm sure a lot of us would have been to a music concert at some point in time, uh, you know, at some point in time. And one of the things which you, all of us would have observed with a music concert is you have a performer who is on stage and who is dishing out some amazing songs. And in front of him or her, you have an amazing audience who is getting an experience of their lifetime. What you also notice is a stage where the performer is performing. You have lights, you have speakers, you have sounds, you have musical instruments, you have a rescue team and a safety team to ensure that everything goes on well. Now, if any of these things is missing, will the audience have the same experience that they are getting on an actual live music concert? Most, uh, most likely, no. And comparing that to software engineering, your performers are the developers and we are dishing out features and applications to our consumers. And what we need, we need, we need a platform team who gives us an infrastructure. We need a platform team that gives me the tools and automations that is required to build my application. I need a team that helps me deploy my applications to the production and different environments that I have. And finally, I need a team that also helps me ensure that the platform that I have gives me features to secure the application that I have deployed. So more or less, a platform is similar to a concert. Developers are similar to performers. And platform engineering is all about giving the users an experience of their lifetime by ensuring a great concert. That is my analogy today. I don't know whether Sri liked it or not, but Sri, what do you want to add in terms of your thoughts around platform engineering? Sure, I really enjoyed that analogy, uh, also. So um, I think so. Pla platform engineering kind of it abstracts the complexity from software development, and it provides developers with a platform or a portal to build software, right? And it, uh, it it actually helps developers focus on actually developing software instead of struggling with complex infrastructure and tools. I like to think of it as a paved path um, for frictionless self service. Um, and the goal here is to enhance developer productivity and user experience. Um, I also want to mention that Gartner estimates that platform engineering is one of the top um, emerging trends of 2024. Um, and that 80% of large software engineering or uh, engineering organizations will establish platform engineering teams by 2026. Um, that's my uh, two cents on platform engineering. And Frank, do you want to add anything to this? Um, yeah, so from a developer perspective, like platform engineering really is, uh, I consider it fixing things that annoy me. I, I would, that was like, that's probably like my summary. I feel like a lot of projects and ideas and open source things came from that very sentiment. Like if you think about like, okay, where did Docker come from? Well, like Chef was terrible. So someone made Docker and then someone was like, hey, deploying Docker, like, like you know, managing Docker and deploying it really sucks. So then like, you know, they made Swarm and then someone was like, hey, Swarm actually kind of sucks too. And like managing all this is really annoying. So then they make Kubernetes. And like, I'm actually curious to see like where we go from there, right? Like, and then like, you know, <laughs> that's like a, that's a lot. I think a lot of projects just came from that. So if, if we talk about platform engineering, that's pretty much where, where, I'm, where I'm like coming from. <laughs> That's a pretty interesting take. You know, if, he, if if there's something not working, let me just go there and fix it. I, I I really like that. And I think a lot of us, you know, who are, who are joining in or who are here on this call as well, uh, we do have a fair bit of understanding when it comes to platform engineering. And uh, a lot of people that whom we have interacted with also know about platform engineering. But then one of the concerns that they always have is how do they start their journey? How do they gauge where they are? how do they understand whether they require a platform or not in the first place so based on our discussions with our clients with our customers with the larger platform community what we have done is we have come up with a platform engineering reference architecture ebook and what we have done in this ebook is based on all our discussions all our learnings we have put up guides we have put up blueprints we have put up uh, reference architectures that will help you and your team start your platform journey. 
uh, because we realize you know it's very difficult to get started uh, because there are so many things around you so many tools so many terms being thrown at you so we thought that this would be a great starting point for you so this ebook is free to download all you have to do is scan the qr code that's there on your screen to get your hands onto this ebook now like i said you know there has been a lot of research and learnings that we have put it in this book so it's virtually impossible to cover everything from this book in this webinar but i will still touch upon a couple of things uh, that is a part of this ebook one of the things that we have presented in this ebook is a reference capability map so what this essentially means is that every time you talk about a platform your platform essentially provides certain services certain capabilities for your developers for them to accomplish their task and you know these these can be in different categories uh, you know we have put them into three major buckets so there are services that help developers build a service and these fall under a developed bucket and all the capabilities like workload specifications inner development group service templates these are the service these are the capabilities that your platform offers which helps your developers build something similarly there are some capabilities that helps your developers uh, make these services by consuming certain things so you know things like databases things like messaging queues things like caching these are the external services that your that, that the services your developers are building will consume so those fall into a consume bucket so similarly you know we have listed a discover bucket as well where we have certain services which are essentially required to you know monitor or enhance your offering enhance your service so you know we have things like observability we have things like uh, developer portals which you know give you a larger view of your entire process and helps you streamline that entire workflow that you have in place uh, along with that what we have also done is we have come up with a triple a flame framework which we call as assess adopt and accelerate so what you see on your screen are the develop consume and discover categories that we spoke about and this is the cycle which you will continue doing to evolve your platform journey because we all know that platform engineering is not a one time effort it's something that is continuous so you start you identify the capabilities that are required you bring in the right tools the right technology the right people into your platform engineering team your platform environment and then go on through the cycle of adopt accelerate and assess and sorry assess adopt and accelerate and then that's how you keep going on to become a more mature organization when it comes to using platforms now when i gave the analogy of musicians and concert and performers you know we we saw that there's a lot of preparation that goes by the crew who is behind the performer in setting up the stage setting up the lighting and that's really crucial for a performer's experience as well as for the experience of the audience who is sitting there and the success doesn't actually just depend on the significance or the importance of the platform here but it depends more on the experience that the platform provides to the developers or the performers so with that you know let me just open this discussion with uh, uh, shri and frank and uh, the first one to uh, that we would want to discuss is the role of developer experience in the success of a platform so how important is that when it comes to measuring the success of a platform shri would you like to go ahead first sure um so an intuitive and smooth developer experience allows teams to focus more time on creativity um and and it, it allows teams to focus on business impact rather than dealing with platform related issues um for example at spotify scale right even a 10% improvement in developer productivity can translate into significant cost savings and uh, increased capacity which is equivalent to several hundred developers and an improved developer experience also en uh, enhances engagement and it is strongly correlated with overall company performance we have also learned through um, our iterative development that um, users or developers who are engaged and find their tools easy to use are more likely to be productive and innovative and uh, in order to measure developer experience right i would reference a practice from spotify which is where we conduct regular platform specific engineering surveys and the results of which are uh, utilized to guide platform related efforts and also um reducing 
context switching, unnecessary context switching for developers is a key goal. And internal developer portals like Backstage aim to centralize all these non, uh, all non-development tasks, and they and then it makes it easier for developers to stay focused on their work and thereby reduce cognitive load. Um, we also measure the time it takes from code commit to deployment, and we glean insights into the efficient the efficiency of the development process. Um, faster cycle times generally indicate a better developer experience. That's interesting. I think, yeah, I think I think I would take both the things that you spoke about, you know, especially talking about context switching, because I think today, you know, we expect our developers to do a lot of things with the whole shift left ideology. You know, they they, they are doing tons of different things. And I think you need a, a, a platform that actually helps them do that. I think Frank can be a more better person here to give his developer perspective to things. So, Frank, why don't you share your thoughts on this? Yeah, so kind of going back to what I mentioned earlier about fixing things that annoy me, um, I think that is like one of the challenges for platform and like why developer experience is so important because if you build a platform and then developers don't have a good experience with it, they're going to build their own thing um, and they might build their own thing on top of it. There's a hack or uh, story of my life is uh, spending three days automating something manual that takes me 10 minutes, right? Like that is the story of Every developer probably has this experience, right? Where you feel frustrated. If you get frustrated at something, you can't help but want to do something. That's sort of why we're in this industry part of it, right? Why we enjoy enjoy doing this. Um, so the other thing that like can be tricky is like what developer experience means, especially when you're building stuff, because sometimes you get requirements from the wrong people. Like oftentimes you can get, let's say someone's leading a platform and it's like a senior staff engineer, like a VP of engineering, giving you these requirements. But after you start building stuff, you realize that the actual user is like, this is not what they want or need. And that can be very confusing. And then the third thing is like developers can be your best and worst customer. Um, and like kind of before Spotify, I worked at AWS as well and very similar. Um, so like developers are your customers. They're really smart, have great insight, but they also like, uh are really good at doing things you don't want right that is like um a one thing that's like very tricky so um i think working with developers is uh like 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 trying to figure out what like a good developer experience means and actually figure out what their actual problems are instead of just building features for them that they request i think that's like a huge challenge that like um that like when you're trying to talk about developer experience like that's like um, like something that we struggle with a lot on Soundcheck as well, like uh, with our team. Yeah, Suri, anything to add to, to what I just said? I'm sure you have more yeah. experience with this. <laughs> no, that's, that, that, that's a very fair assessment, right? We just don't want to build off of requirements that we get from developers. We want to build the platform as a product. And, um, and, and uh, that involves um, right from uh, understanding what, what the specific need is from a developer perspective, um, and then uh, understanding the impact of developing that within the product is, is, is really important. Um, and I, I also want to take this opportunity to introduce Soundcheck, uh, which is a commercial plugin within Backstage, as I mentioned before. Uh, what Soundcheck does is it runs automated checks against various software components, um, and it provides developers with detailed feedback on various aspects such as quality, component tech health, security, Security and compliance, um, and continuous monitoring and automated compliance checks um, within Soundcheck ensure that developers are promptly informed of any deviations from the standards. And um, what this is, uh, what this will help achieve is. Um, in maintaining a consistent development experience. And um, within Soundcheck, one of the onboarding metrics we consider is how long it takes for an adopter to ship their first track, which is a scorecard. Um, and Frank has a demo which where uh, he'll show uh, what a track means. Um, and uh, yes, that's, that's, that's just what I wanted to add on. Yes, I think so, so every webinar I do, I do pick up things from the guests that, uh, that share some insightful things and I think for me, when Frank said developers can be your worst customers, I think that's that's my uh, pickup for uh, for today's webinar. I think that's that that's pretty well uh, put out, Frank. I think you know even as part of the uh, platform working group at the CNCF, uh, one of the critical things that we discussed was you know how to treat your platform as a product. Like Sri uh, actually added on that until unless you treat it as a product, you don't understand what your customers or your developers need. 
it becomes really difficult in terms of what you are building and how successful uh, you know it will be so taking that i, I think you know we, we we had a very good uh, you know so some insights around uh, developer experience and the success of a platform and while these are very crucial uh, for the success of any platform uh, the essential or the first step here is to actually build a platform in the first phase so while we we did a reverse over here a uno reverse if you if you can say so 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 we spoke about the success of a platform first but then now we are getting into building of platforms and uh, we definitely agree that there are a lot of challenges involved in building platforms and uh, these challenges are not only limited to technical challenges but then there are a lot of cultural challenges uh, that are involved here as well so uh, again you know shri frank uh, what are your thoughts which uh, you know which, which you feel you know considering the time you have spent with backstage uh, you know what are the typical challenges that that teams come across while they are building platforms yeah i can take that so um i'd like to share some insights from our experience building soundcheck within uh, spotify and um soundcheck is used internally at spotify at scale and we've also commercialized it for external adopters and um achieving developer adoption uh, was initially challenging mainly due to a lack of awareness or understanding of what the plugin can do for the users and uh, if the internal developer portal or the plugin lacks user friendliness or it it fails to integrate seamlessly with the tools that developers are already using um then adoption rates have been typically found to decline and it is also important to ensure that the portal or the plugin it integrates um um with with smoothly with the with the workflows that the developers are already using um what this helps do is it it reduces the friction of switch context switching as we uh, spoke about before and it also uh, allows for a cohesive development experience and maintaining engagement was something that we uh, it was a significant uh, hurdle um and it's it's also a significant hurdle from external um blog posts that i've read uh, about building uh, internal developer portals so it's crucial to provide continuous updates to our users and improvements and communicate clearly about what new features um uh, are are being built to keep developers interested and invested and another point to consider is that developers are usually hesitant to switch from familiar tools and processes so there's like a cultural um perspective involved as well um and it in it, it, it we found that aligning different teams and departments um and their and considering their priorities um to remove friction uh, and enhance the developer pro adoption process the, the plugin adoption process to be something that we've found uh, um successful and lastly without a clear champion or an owner within an organization these initiatives are not going to be um uh, to to continue and to uh, bring success so in order to not lose momentum it's important to have um, uh, an ownership or a, an owner within the organization at uh, at spotify um our, our pra we practice building backstage uh, as a product as i mentioned before so what this involves is treating the platform and the plugins within it with the same rigor and focus as any other external product and we in order to do that do that do that we prioritize user experience reliability and continuous improvement practices based on uh, feedback from our adopters and um, another pra crucial practice that we've learned here is dog fooding uh, we use our uh, platform internally before we release it for our external users and this allows for extensive testing at scale we uncover bugs early in the cycle uh, we are aware of usability issues from our internal users and uh, we we are able to unlock and figure out performance bottlenecks as well, as well. and uh, the advantages of this approach include a more polished and robust product upon release and increase confidence in the platform's capabilities and again uh, performance is, has been known to um, improve frank uh, is there anything you want to add on to that yeah cool i mean I, I can offer some insight on like for example you mentioned like why developers are resistant to change sometimes and the big reason is uh is just resources right like i have i have yet in my engineering career to be on a team where i'm like hey we have too many engineers right that's never never been the case um uh and i think that is like a uh, kind of a challenge i'm going to kind of talk a little bit about like backstage and adopting something like an idp and there's a big kind of like upfront curve 
with that, where it takes like, like once you have everything set up, it's beautiful, right? Like when I came to Spotify, I looked at it, I'm like, wow, this is great. But if you don't like um, invest that early upfront cost and time to it, it can be um, very difficult. Like, like you don't see the benefits until you get to a certain point. And I feel that's how it is with a lot of platforms where um, once you have that like enough adoption, then suddenly things start flowing together. But before you have that, it can be very, very challenging where you say some to an engineer is like, hey, you're gonna be, you need to spend like three weeks adopting this new tool and like you have no benefit, right? Like you have very, very you see very few benefit. Um, and um, that kind of goes back to what Sri mentioned earlier about like, hey, you need owners, you need people to drive that kind of initiatives. And um, going to shill soundtrack a little bit more where like our, our plugin is actually like one of the things that helps drive those those adoptions where um, it allows you to be like have a lot more visibility and like, hey, what are we trying to promote? Like what kind of changes are we trying to do in the org? How are we trying to align things? Right. Um, and yeah, cool. That's kind of my 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 two cents here yeah and cost is um a uh, high uh, initial upfront cost is something that is um a problem with a lot of organizations and that's um and it's not just with resources right uh, you you need to make sure that uh we have enough resources to uh, build the portal within the organization and that's exactly the problem we are aiming to solve with uh, spotify portal for backstage which we released in april 2024 um it's portal for backstage is a spotify portal for backstage is a no code idp designed to simplify setup and maintenance for um, external organizations and what portal does it automates the backstage installation process into a few steps and it provides guidance throughout uh, the configuration. It, it facilitates quick adoption and reduces ongoing maintenance burdens by leveraging Spotify's expertise um, with built-in opinionation and enhancements. Interesting insights here. You know, I think you 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 really pointed out well about the concern between a stagnant platform and innovation. Uh, you know, there has to be a balance. I think whenever we talk about platforms and portals, uh, we often talk about abstraction versus flexibility. How much of things you need to be abstracted, uh, you need to abstract from your developers versus how much flexibility you want uh, them to have. And I think that that similar discussion is also uh, very valid when it comes to uh, how do you keep your platform maintained up to date while also ensuring that you are innovating, you are getting on new features because you know, new technologies are coming in, your developers are, you know, building applications in a way that was completely different from how it, how it was yesterday. So, you know, your platform needs to keep, keep, keep uh, adapting to that. I think there was one question from LinkedIn that I just got in. I mean, I, it, for some reason it didn't come on automatically. So I'm just putting it up on screen. Uh, now I'm, I'm sorry, I was not, I'm not aware of what part of the discussion this question was related to, but Brendan asked, uh, on LinkedIn, uh, was the adoption affected by the reaction of developers to the idea of compliance? Uh, I don't know what exactly the discussion phase uh, was when this question was asked, but uh, I guess he's asking more about uh, the, the whole idea of compliance. When you have a platform in place, you might have you know a lot of guardrails or checks in place. So how do you think the developer experience actually is affected by compliance or guardrails in place? Any Any thoughts? Um, I can take a stab at it and, and Frank, yeah. uh, please add on uh, with what you think. So um, when um, so when we initially adopted Soundcheck within Spotify, for example, um, uh, the, we had to explain um, the reasoning behind what problem that the, the plugin is solving, right? Um, and backstage was backstage is something that a lot of, uh, we use uh, on a daily basis within Spotify. Um, so assessing the impact and explaining the impact to development teams helped us um, increase compliance and helped us increase adoption of the plugin as well. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if I answered the question, uh, but Frank, do you have any other, uh, anything else to add on? Um, yeah, so I guess um, from my side is as a developer, sometimes the main problem is like, I don't actually know what I'm supposed to use um uh sometimes right for example like um i don't know exactly like i don't know that i'm not compliant right that's the first first problem second problem is that oftentimes like for example if you get a lot of you're onboarding new engineers 
and um, uh, they they aren't familiar with the technologies and the tools available. That's like a second part of like, hey, like what um, what am I even supposed to use? Um, at Spotify, we have this thing called Golden Technologies, which I think is like very helpful, where we have a set of technologies that are um, that we kind of define as like these are very well supported within the platforms, uh, within the platform teams and with the platforms. However, kind of getting to that point was a huge struggle, and like Soundcheck was one of the ways we did it. Um, I think the big um, uh, way to like get that adoption, I think Sri mentioned, which is like, hey, like we have to really get engineers to understand the benefits, right? Um, and like what we're trying to do. And uh, oftentimes the benefits is more of a long-term thing rather than a short-term thing. So you have to drive that from the top down. Um, so the second point is really about like engineering culture, right? Like, like you, I, I, I really like how you mentioned, like you need to have a fine balance and, and, and sometimes that, um, can, is really driven by like a good, strong engineering culture, um, of, um, allowing, uh, people to kind of like be, try new things and be invented to hack around, uh, which is why I think backstage is really cool. Um, so, uh, I know, like, I'm not sure how how familiar people are with backstage, but there's a concept called plugins where you can basically build like a module for backstage. And for example, within Spotify, we have hundreds of these and a lot of them are uh, built in hack projects. A lot of the, the major plugins was like a, a huge, a huge part of it was just um, from hacks. I think even Soundcheck, I think came from out of a hack that someone did because they were tired of tracking everything on spreadsheets, right? That's how, that's how we did it before Soundcheck. So, um, uh, I think this all kind of circles back to that whole concept of fixing things that annoy me. Um, and, um, uh, I think backstage is like a great platform for that because it, it gives you that level of like customization and it actually helps drive that kind of engineering culture. Right. Uh, of like being like, hey, like if you want to fix something, why don't you try building a backstage plugin? Then everyone has access to it. It's discoverable. It's all in one place, and then like um, it's at least somewhat standardized, right? So um, yeah. And cool. and we've also found gamic gamification to be really uh, helpful, right? Um, because if we if engineers see that team A has a higher compliance or a higher uh, scorecard. Um, than team B. It's like a healthy competition where they kind of have fun um, uh, using gamified uh, methods to uh, get things done. Interesting. I think we have answered Brendan's question pretty well. You know, uh, he, his question was more around what we exactly discussed. You know, it was the adoption affected by the idea of compliance. And I think uh, you you touched upon a couple of good points that, you know, uh, making it, making compliance as a culture and Telling the developers, uh, you know, he first helping them understand why compliance is needed and then keeping an eye on whether you are compliant or not. And then, you know, helping that approach build the uh, next stage of uh, of platform. So uh, thanks so much, Brendan, for asking those questions. I hope we answered your questions well. If we didn't, you can catch hold of any three of us, uh, you know, outside of this webinar. And I'm sure we would be able to uh, help you out. So uh, moving on to the next phase uh, of the discussion, uh, which is the key for today's webinar, and that's going to be Backstage. Uh, it's one of the most popular tools that's uh, available out there that helps you build uh, developer portals. Uh, I have experienced it myself. Uh, you know, I've built a couple of them uh, hosted on my local setup, uh, playing around with plugins. And I think what Sri mentioned about the portal, which actually automates the entire Backstage installation part, that is something which I'll uh, probably try after this webinar as well. So uh, uh, making the stage open for Siri and Frank to take all of us through on a journey of backstage, what it is, how it helps, and touch upon sound check as well. So Sri, over to you. Thank you. Um, so backstage is an open platform uh, for building developer portals. We created it at Spotify and open sourced it during uh, Hack Week in March 2020. 2020. And since open sourcing it, Backstage has become a sandbox project at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF, which is home to Kubernetes and Envoy. Um, a lot has, has been written about Spotify's engineering culture, uh, how we are organized and our agile ways of working. We've always believed that speed and ingenuity comes from uh, having autonomous development teams. 
Um, but as we learned firsthand, the faster you grow, the more fragmented and complex your software ecosystem becomes, right? And then everything slows down again. Um, in 2016, Spotify was in a hyper growth mode, uh, expanding from a music, music term, streaming app to a highly personalized audio, audio experience. Um, but onboarding new engineers was becoming hyper confusing. And so we focused on speed to market. Um, it, our teams were slowing down because of internal fragmentation and our headcount kept going up. Um, and individual developer effectiveness metrics were going down. We started measuring the number of dates engineers, new, new engineers took to get to their 10th PR, which was skyrocketing to 60 days. And, um, and we knew we, need, we needed to solve this, which is why Backstage was introduced. And after Backstage was introduced, the number dropped to only 20. Um, so on this slide, um, we, I, I want to talk about um, what every development sh shop wants, right? They roughly want the same things. Uh, speed without compromising safety, scale without compromising quality, and the ability to tame the increasingly chaotic software ecosystem. And Spotify is no different. Next slide, please, Atul. Uh, Backstage was built to tame the chaos, and that changed everything. It aligned a distributed autonomous culture uh, and brought together hundreds of squads, thousands of engineers, and tens of thousands of software companies. So Backstage Spotify now enables better collaboration, unlocks collective potential, and empowers teams to do what they do best. And this is a timeline of Spotify's journey with Backstage from humble beginnings to industry standard. Um, this, uh, at, in 2024, uh, we've, we released uh, Portal as well, which is something that uh, we need to add on to this slide. Um, and then uh, next slide, please. So there's a lot of there are a lot of features to backstage, but the, there's three main jobs to be done. Uh, if you look at this slide, there's uh, the ability to create new software in seconds, aligned to your best practices, manage all software um, teams own in one centralized location, and exploring the entire software ecosystem, the ability to uh, explore, uh, enabling collaboration ac uh, across your organization. So instead of being frustrated by infrastructure, your developers get back control over it. Uh, this frees them to focus on what they want to focus on, which is building impactful uh, features for the business. Um, I'll now hand it over to Frank for a backstage demo. Cool. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to just do kind of a quick demo of backstage. And then afterwards, we're going to demo soundcheck. Um, so this is uh, the catalog of backstage, which is probably like one of the core elements. I mean, it's not one of, it is the core element of backstage where all of your services, components, databases can be registered um, as what we call like a, like a, a component within Backstage, which lets us have a lot of stuff. So this is obviously fake. If you look at the names, they're not actual <laughs> components. Um, but um, I, I made a couple of uh, components here that you can see. So within these teams, I have this kind of like uh, cool front end and then a uh, cool back end here. And if you go into it, um, you can kind of see that, like, for example, one of the great things is that if you have things set up correctly, you can look, oh, like these are, here's kind of these relationships. You can go and search things. For example, I have this system called Cool System. And if you go in here, you can see, oh, I have like a front end and a back end and discoverability is, is super easy. Um, this, when I first looked at Backstage, this was like a huge benefit. So before this, I was at AWS and it was impossible to find things. I'm, I'm, it's very, very hard to know like like who owns what. And it's also like outside of your team as well. Like if you want to go and find something uh, with the search functionality, for example. Um, I don't have this set up here, but for example, you could have links to like tech docs and uh, and things like that. Um, and like the actual URL of the website. Um, so that's something that's cool. So the next thing we talked about earlier was, hey, let's, how do we um, create and like, what do we use? So one of the other core components what I like, uh, which I really enjoy is like these kind of like templating and allows you to create things. So for example, here's an example of like, hey, I want to create a uh, node. So let's say like, I want a uh, cool test project. Um, and then uh, I can do this. So I can put my that and I can put tool test project. And then I can review and then I'll create this. Um, and then everything gets kind of done within Backstage. And if I look at my repos, bam, now I have a new repo with cool test projects. Um, and then it populates kind of like the uh, annotations for Backstage. Um, and then if you kind of look at it, now I have this um, 
new backstage component that gets all of like the uh, benefits. So this is really nice uh, once you have things set up. So you don't have to worry about like, hey, like, what am I creating? Um, how do I make sure I, all my catalog is aligned? If you do everything through backstage, basically like everything just works, um, which is really the key metric of platform. If you're doing your platform right, everything just works, right? Um, cool. So the other thing that I want to talk about is uh, real quick is just the concept of like these plugins, right? Uh, I, I mentioned earlier. So let me look at, uh, oh, um, do uh, if I look at this. So if I look at the super cool backend, for example, um, I added the Kubernetes plugin. Unfortunately, I'm having some problem with the Kubernetes off right now, uh, which is like the bane of my existence, honestly. But um, it, it's not working. But like, for example, here, like if you have your Kubernetes set up correctly, which I apparently don't, um, uh, you can see all of your Kubernetes clusters. And this is like an open source plugin that people have developed. And um, there's tons and tons of plugins that are available open source. And then we also, for example, uh, have our uh, paid plugin bundle. And uh, that's what uh, me and Sri work on. Uh, we work on specifically Soundcheck. So I'm going to pass over to Sri real quick to just uh, discuss Soundcheck while I set stuff up in the background uh, for, for that demo. Sounds great. So this is... Um... I love sharing um, this spreadsheet here, which is um, confusing to look at. Um, and that's exactly the problem that we, we are solving with Soundcheck. Um, at Spotify scale, uh, teams handle tens of thousands of software components daily. And before Soundcheck, we had uh, 30,000 plus software components in backstage. And tracking them manually through spreadsheets like this became unsustainable, right? Imagine uh, tracking um, hundreds of spreadsheets for all of these components. Um, and, and we used a service operational quality checklist initially to rate services on standards like security, recoverability, maintainability, et cetera. But it was getting really impractical practical to maintain them. And this complexity led us to develop Soundcheck, um, which streamlined tracking and measuring of tech health of our software components. And it significantly improved our developer experience. Um, I'm going to show you a quick peek on what the data tells us about the impact of Soundcheck at Spotify. Uh, the first thing is productivity boosts. Higher pass rates lead, lead to more deployments with up to seven additional deployments per percentage point gained at the component level. And then the next one is efficiency gains. Uh, squads were found to maintain an 85% track pass rate. Um, and a track is a long-term tech health initiative within Soundcheck. Um, and they saw a 20% decrease in master build failures and a 25% decrease in high urgency incidents. And then the next one is virtuous cycle, right? So all, uh, squads resolve high urgency incidents um, in about 1.5 uh, hours faster uh, than uh, per 10 percentage points in their golden state track, which is one of the tracks that uh, um, with, that uh, monitor long-term tech health um, within uh, Spotify. And they save about five hours monthly with an average of three high urgency incidents per month. Um, and that with, with that, uh, showing the impact of what Soundcheck can do. Um, I'm going to transfer uh, back to Frank for a demo of Soundcheck. Cool. So this is um, what Soundcheck looks like on a component page. So let's say I'm the owner of this super cool backend. And I'm taking a look at like, hey, like, how's my component doing? So um, for example, we have, a, we have like two kind of like pre-canned uh, checks. So this is like, for example, recommended GitHub settings. So I can look and be like, oh, I'm doing pretty good on this one, but let me take a look at my SEM compliance and I'm not doing as well here, right? So you can see I have a lot of a lot of lot of issues. So um, uh, this is like a really great way to just have awareness and and uh, be like, hey, what can I fix? So the next part is kind of the gamification. So um, I'm like, hey, let's actually go and fix this. So let me take a look. So um, I'm gonna go into my uh, super cool backend. So let's say, let me go to my repo and um, I have this in here. So it's like, hey, I'm missing a readme file. So let me add a readme file. So I can put some readme. And then I'm gonna go ahead and commit to, to master direct, to main directly, which is not something we normally do, but for this demo, I will. Um, so, uh, and then once I'm done that, um, uh, this basically, I have it set to update basically every minute. Um, once that triggers, 
uh, it's going to basically be like, hey, like now your your check is passed. Let me just do push. OK, well, let me let me come back to this a little bit uh, once that's once that's done. Um, OK, cool. Uh, so um, let's go to like the actual sound check and explain kind of what a check is and what a track is. So uh, Sri touched on this earlier. So a check um, here is, for example, like uh, like like an element of a track. So uh, we have force push disable. For example, right, um, and you can basically set these um, via uh, rules. So, for example, um, we have what we call a fact, which is just like um, can come from many, many different sources. This fact, for example, comes from GitHub. So, um, uh, for example, in here we can say like, "Hey, we want to make sure force push equals the false." Uh, you can pat, you can create like these messages that can be very helpful to users uh, to teach them like how to fix this. Um, so it's like a great way to like create alignment um, for for different like compliance and like uh, adoption of tooling, making sure people are doing the right thing. Um, and then uh, in terms of tracks, um, for example, here, uh, oh, so for example, this track is uh, if you look at this, this is like a collection of these uh, checks basically, and. Um, that is like the very general shape. Uh, there's actually a lot of power. For example, uh, you can write a lot of pretty complicated checks uh, if you kind of learn about, um, there's like all, tons of operators, for example. And then the other thing that is part of this is um, what we call collectors. So uh, fat collectors are where we get the data and we have tons of integrations. For example, here I have Cal uh, GitHub and uh, source control management, which interfaces with you know GitLab and like, uh, Azure DevOps, uh, GitHub, like all of those things. On top of that, we have lots of other integrations. For example, we have a PagerDuty integration that we've built. Uh, we also have uh, Datadog, for example. So uh, it's very, it's a very, very powerful tool. Unless you collect data from like a lot of different places. Um, so real quick, I'm gonna kind of create, go through like, okay, I want to create a check and a track to uh, to push something. So let's say I want um, to make sure I want to create something that is like hey, I want to make sure uh, your component is production ready. So I can create a check that's like uh, uh, production ready. And I can do like, you know, I'll just put whatever there. And then, for example, in the rule, I can say like, hey, I want the life cycle of this, um, of this component to be set to production, right? So if I go to the life cycle, and then I can say equal to production. And then in here, you know, I pass up a little smiley face. If you fill up a little, little sad face. Um, and then for kind, let's say I want to only look at, for example, services, right? And then you can see all of these components that are going to be affected, which is like, and then uh, finally, um, I'm going to run this, let's say like every minute, just for demo purposes, let's say 30 seconds. Cool. And then I'm going to save this. So that creates a check. And now I have to create a track. Um, so let's create a track that says like, hey, uh, prod ready. Um, and then I'm going to assign this to myself. And then we can pull this in. So production ready, we can put that in here. And then same thing. Let's say we just want to do services and components. Cool. And then we'll save that. Um, so now that we have that, um, we can go back to our component here. Um, let me see here. Now, if we refresh, you will see that um, now, like we have this check and the it's like production ready. Um, now, the next thing that uh, is also kind of cool is like we have analytics on tracks, which is like basically a huge replacement for spreadsheets. So, if we look at this, we have an analytics page. You can see, all right, so like about fifty percent of our components are production ready. And then you can see this is uh, just today, you know, we spiked up here because we just created this track today. And then you can see all the entities and um, what their status is. The other nice thing is there's a lot of filtering. So for example, let's say I'm, uh, I'm the owner of Toast. So I can look and be like, hey, like uh, which components are specific to me, right? Um, and this can be very powerful for like some of these larger ones. For example, let's look at this one. Um, uh, which has you know a lot more details, and you can kind of see um, 
well, this data is not very populated right now, but like, for example, I think actually this one, maybe. Okay, anyways, yeah, like um, once we, like, for example, if you have historical data, you can see like how things are doing, right? Um, yeah, cool. So that was just like a really quick demo of like sound check um, and uh, backstage. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty good, Frank, I would say. I mean, you know, you did outline what backstage is all about and then touching upon the the highlights of the soundcheck plugin and how it helps you to ensure that you know all the things all the services that you are having within your platform is uh, is you no know, is 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 working fine uh, so yeah anything I, I think here are some great resources to uh, for anyone who wants to uh, start their backstage journey or want to learn more about backstage uh, you can visit their website they do conduct uh, there's a community as well so you can check it out on GitHub. Uh, quite an active community on Discord as well, and you can check out the Soundcheck plugin as well. Now, while Frank was giving a demo, and uh, you know, like I said, I had uh, played around with Backstage a little, uh, a little bit of. So I think uh, I will. What I'll do is I'll just quickly share my screen, which is your uh, Backstage plugins, because that is essentially what builds uh, Backstage. There are a lot of tons of plugins, uh, you know, that that Backstage supports and. There are a lot of different use cases uh, for each of these plugins. So uh, what you're seeing here is the Backstage website uh, at the Plugins tab. And here are some of the core features uh, which, which Backstage provides. So the catalog, which is the essence like Frank and Sri mentioned. Uh, apart from that, uh, you know, there's also a Kubernetes plugin where, you know, which uh, Frank was trying to show, which he was having an uh, you know, auth, auth issue with. And uh, with the person Frank is who, who who doesn't like things not working? I'm I'm hoping that there will be some uh, code check-in by Frank into this Kubernetes plugin to ensure the authentication actually <laughs> actually works. Uh, so yeah, I, I think one of the great uh, plugins that I personally liked with Backstage was the search uh, because often what happens is when you're uh, when you're building your portal or when you are building, uh, I mean yeah, when you're building your portal and when you have a lot of capabilities, sometimes it becomes really difficult to find the exact thing that you need, and that's what uh, the search plugin actually uh, does for you. So uh, this is a pretty good, uh, you know, site for plugins. So if you are starting your uh, backstage journey, building platforms, uh, building your portals, uh, there are a lot of uh, plugins that are available here, which connects to your cloud providers, which connects to uh, a lot of different services. So there are a lot of plugins here. You can just go ahead, keep exploring them to, uh, you know, build a platform uh that's 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 uh that suits your uh developers so uh yeah before i think i sum up what i'll do is i'll go through the comments once again uh to see if we have any further questions uh anywhere for some reason linkedin has not been behaving well today i have not been getting the comments from there automatically so i'm just uh, going there and checking uh meanwhile there is a question from Luis, who is asking something about the uh, soundcheck plugin. So yeah, uh, they ask if is soundcheck plugin native to Backstage, or we can use it with other open source developer platform builders too. Yeah, uh, I can take that. So soundcheck is a commercial plugin, um, and uh, if you look at the link that uh, Atul shared on uh, his slides, um, you can click on that link and you'll be able to talk to the team that will uh, be able to help you through the process for um, getting soundcheck. Uh, but it's it's not it's not part of the open source um, uh, part of Backstage. Great, uh, thanks, Sri. I think Luis uh, Sri answered your question. Uh, I do see there is one more from Tushar, and I think that's coming in from StreamYard. And Tushar is actually asking, uh, okay, he's playing another Uno reverse reverse card, but he's asking what's the first step, uh, you know, when adopting an IDP for an enterprise. So uh, I think what he's probably trying to ask here is that when you have decided that you want a platform, maybe when you decide that there's a there's a platform that's needed, uh, what are the first a uh, few things that teams must pay attention on when they are adopting a platform. Um, I can try take a stab at that. So um, I would say the first thing is um, even before we adopt the IDP, right? Organizations need to uh, figure out what the impact is going to be for adopting an uh, 
after adopting an IDP, what, what is the problem that they want to solve? That's the first thing that they, might, they must assess. And once they uh, understand that there is a need and that they need to um, adopt an IDP in order to solve their problems, um, I think the first step to uh, doing that would be to um, probably uh, look at a trial, um, a, a trial the IDP for a, uh, for a certain period of time. Um, and backstage in Backstage's example, you can uh, go to the link that Atul shared and you can probably try it out and see if it's impacting, what is the positive impact of using the IDP on a particular team, a smaller team, uh, for instance. Um, and we talk about a Backstage champion within Backstage who is usually uh, the person who runs through or who owns the the process and who takes ownership of um, getting the adoption done for a specific team first and then once that is working well the adoption can be uh, adoption of the idp can be spread to uh, other teams as well yeah i mean i can add on i think really the first step as you said is like just try it like uh go ahead and go ahead and take a look because um for, backstage is great because it's open source so you can go ahead and like spin it up and, and take a spend take a stab at it um, there, there's, uh, there's, there's really, in my opinion, no downsides to doing that. Um, second of all, I think it's uh, taking a step back from that. Like to me, I'm like, I think you should really catalog, like, what are you using, uh, to solve the problems an IDP would do? For example, if you look at soundcheck, uh, one of the things and even catalog, I think spreadsheets are probably a big one. Slack channels are another one. And, and it's good to document those things because when you're thinking about like the value proposition, because as we mentioned earlier, it can be some effort to, it's not non-trivial effort to adopt something like this. Um, uh, bring those value propositions of like, hey, like our current processes is, is pretty bad. And it's, we're gonna save money, honestly, by investing in something like this, right? Um, and that that is a very, very powerful uh, business proposal or like a, a way to propose this, this, this kind of change, right? Um, uh, cool. Yeah, that's that's kind of my my little little two cents there. <laughs> Interesting. So, uh, Tushar, I think you know Sri and Frank uh, did answer your question uh, in a way. Uh, I will be a little selfish over here, and I'll uh, ask you to look at the CNCF uh, platform white paper as well that uh, I was a part of. And what this paper actually does is it it actually tells uh, teams as to how should they adopt a platform and what are the different levels through which each team goes through as they are maturing. So, you know, you touch upon things like investment, like Sri mentioned, you know, there has to be some investments from the stakeholders within a platform. And then, you know, how do you build an interface for it? Do you want, you know, some for some teams, even a simple bash script or a text document might be a thin viable platform is what, what we say TVP. Uh, you know, so how do you build on top of it? Uh, so I think this is a, the, the white paper is a good place uh, to share where you could also understand how to go about your uh, platform journey. Uh, before we end, I think there is one last question by Uday and I think I am, uh, Uday, I've already changed the slide uh, just for you. Uh, you know, you have asked about if there are any good resources to get started in local developer environment, hello world to Backstage. Uh, uh, so Uday, these are the links here. You can go to backstage. Uh, IO and try it. The, there are the ready-made, uh, you know, installation available. The document is fairly straightforward, I would say. So, you know, set up a couple of things, your node in place, uh, you'll have backstage running and it will have the uh, templates and the catalog ready as well. So the demo which you show, which Frank showed us about the Node.js template connecting to the GitHub repo and deploying everything. These things are by default, uh, you know, present in the demo that is provided on the backstage website. So uh, Uday, yes, backstage.io is your is the answer to your question. Just head there and try the Hello World documentation. If it doesn't work, you can very well reach out to Sri and Frank, and they would be happy to connect you with the larger team and help you move ahead in your backstage journey. So yes, uh, that's bring, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. I think we have uh, hit the time, and uh, I had seen a lot of people joining in a lot of interesting questions uh, that we had you know right from uh, implementations to technical questions to how tos and uh, the entire gamut of things uh, but i think we did touch upon uh, two real crucial aspects uh, in today's webinar you know we touched upon how developer experience uh, affects the success of a platform and what are the challenges uh, you know that come in while building a platform and both sri and frank uh, gave us very insightful uh, points from their perspectives, you know, from PM's perspective and from a developer's 
uh, perspective. So uh, once again, uh, thanks, Sri. Thank you, Frank, for uh, you know uh, sparing your time with us, with our audience, and uh, educating them about platforms, about Backstage, and all the other plugins and features that uh, you know Backstage offers. Uh, it was it, it it was great, uh, you know, having you here. Uh, and I hope you know if uh, anyone watching, if you have any issues, you know, like I repeated a lot of times, please feel free to reach out to anyone of us, and we would be uh, more than help uh, more than happy to help you out. And uh, anything else related to your platform journey, the ebook is right there for you to uh, get started. And backstage is uh, a, a part of that ebook. So once you once you have the ebook at your in your hands, you will go through your journey and then you'll come across how backstage actually helps uh, so with that i will sign off uh, along with sri and frank from today's webinar uh, thank you so much again for joining in and tuning in uh, we'll be having another webinar uh, soon so keep an eye on our social channels and i would be looking forward to meeting you all again so uh, thank you so much and bye from all of us thank you